Haunted human remains are a trope popular in modern horror. From the twisted ivory puppet in the house on Haunted Hill to the skeletal corpses floating in the swimming pool of Poltergeist. Human bones have long held a place of fear, worship and power throughout history and cultures, eventually manifesting within the horror genre of the 20th century. At the time of the English Civil War, the whisperings of an emergent folk tradition ceded its place in the popular imagination when stories of skulls with seemingly supernatural powers began to seep from the large rural manor houses throughout Britain. Screaming skulls, as they became known, were kept in farmhouses, rectories and family estates, both for protection and through fear of what might happen if they were mistreated, a situation which sent stories spinning through the local vicinity. This is Dark Histories, where the facts are worse than fiction. Hello and welcome to Season 5, Episode 3 of Dark Histories. And this week we've got a fascinating old folktale episode, which I've thoroughly enjoyed researching, really. And it's about a folk tradition that I'd not heard too much about, actually. I didn't know too much about it. Um, so going in, I was quite raw. One thing that I think sort of really shone through for me with this episode was I contacted a fair few people who are known to have these skulls and... Um, just found a really nice bunch of people, basically, that, that were really willing to, you know, you, you expect people to be sick of talking about this stuff by now or, or, or be sick of being contacted. But, yeah, so really just want to say thanks to, you know, everyone, if you listen to this, um, that I contacted and that were, were really helpful in putting this episode together. So, yeah, thanks very much. Without further ado, let's move on. This is, say, season five? Episode three? Yeah, that is right, isn't it? Season three, episode five. No, episode three, season five. Haunted Bones, the Screaming Skulls. Throughout history, heads have been removed and put on display, both as ritual and as a warning to others. As the seat of power within a living human, the head was seen as performing a very special function, and in various cultures, it's become an object of worship. The vessel of a sacred force or the driving force behind each and every individual, the skull was an object to be revered and feared. One of the strongest shows of victory over an enemy was to spike the head for triumphant display, whilst the most valuable sacrifice could come from ritual beheading. At the same time, the guardian power of the skull rose up in parallel, with the bones of ancestors kept for protection and magic or sold for ingredients in powerful potions. In the medieval period, the skulls of saints were worshipped across Europe, whilst various trinkets were used to impart good luck upon the owners of a newly built or renovated house. Witch potions, horses' skulls, live cats and magical runes have all at one time or another been used to ward off evil spirits or protect a household, and in time, the ultimate of these trinkets became the human skull, expanding from the practice of saintly worship to a less exclusive audience. In a mix of pagan religions, ancestor worship, oral folklore and modern twists of ghosts and spirits, the skull has had a long and tangled past, they always given a position of some veneration. One of the more bizarre folk traditions that seemed to have surfaced during the 17th century was the creation of the screaming skull the bones of a dead ancestor or departed tenant of a certain house, usually the largest, most well-historied manor of an area, became an item of some curiosity. It imparted protection upon those it favoured and it struck misfortune upon those who disobeyed its wishes. The screaming skulls blossomed in oral traditions throughout the period. Writing in 1999, academic David Clark identified 32 such stories of screaming skulls that existed throughout the British Isles. Some skulls were far more famous than others, some had much more robust backstories than others, and some were just plain weird. What they all had in common was a story dating back many hundreds of years, and though their wailing may have often been absent, their various and other supernatural powers were not. In most cases, the living, breathing owner of the skull had passed from life through some form of violence or unkindness, 
often with traumatic leanings, and had, before departing the mortal coil, wished for their remains to be kept upon the premises for one reason or another. The legends then grew around the skull, and the fortunes it brought to those that comply, or misfortune it brought down upon to those that chose to ignore these dying wishes. One of the earliest documented reports of a screaming skull from the 19th century is also one of the most famous today, and it concerns a skull known as Dickey, who lives on a windowsill in Tunstead Farm in the county of Derbyshire, deep in the Peak District, an area of national parklands perched at the foot of the Pennines to the south of Manchester. Records of the farm exist dating back as early as 1216, and through its life has played home to his venerable tenants as Francis Tunstead, gamekeeper to the king. In the nearby area, remains of a Bronze Age settlement lie in the ruins of an ancient stone circle. For hundreds of years, the farmhouse has changed family ownership only on a couple of occasions, the Tunsteds holding it as part of their estate for over 300 years, before it found its way to the Brocklehurst family in the 17th century, who held it for a further century. In 1809, whilst writing his travel book of sorts, John Hutchinson brought the skull to wider attention when his Tour Through the High Peak of Derbyshire was published. Having heard a singular account of a human skull being preserved in a house at Tunstead, near the above place, and which was said to be haunted, curiosity induced me to deviate a little, for the purpose of making some inquiries respecting these natural and supernatural appearances. That there are three parts of a human skull in the house is certain, and which I trace to have remained on the premises for near two centuries past, during all the revolutions of owners and tenants in that time. As to the truth of the supernatural appearance, it is not my design either to affirm or contradict, though I have been informed by a credible person, a Mr. Adam Fox, who was brought up in the house, that he has not only repeatedly heard singular noises and observed very extraordinary circumstances, but can produce 50 persons within the parish who have seen an apparition at this place. The skull, however, he reassured readers, was seen as something of a guardian spirit, never disturbing the owners of the house, unless to warn them of approaching death and illness. The skull apparently appeared to only shew its resentment when it was spoken of with disrespect or when its own awful memory of mortality is removed. Hutchinson recorded two occasions when the skull had been removed from the farmhouse, once during renovation work and a second time when it was buried in a nearby churchyard, at which point the skull gave the house no peace and no rest until it was returned. The skull, he was told, was named Dicky, though the question as to why the owners believed it to be that of a female, and yet it had been christened with a male name, was not lost on the curious author. The skull's origins were mired in vague oral traditions, but Hutchinson related a story that it had belonged to one of the house's previous heiresses, who had been murdered and requested that her bones should remain in the property forever. Later investigation into the skull found that Hutchinson had only heard half of the story. In fact, Dickie had been taken to the churchyard and buried on two different occasions. On both, however, disturbances kept the tenants of the house awake all night until it was returned. At one point, it had been tossed into a nearby lake, only to the same end that saw all the fish dead and the skull being promptly fished back out and put back on the windowsill in a downstairs room with a view across the farmland, known affectionately as Dickie's Land. As for the origins, the story told by Hutchinson was quickly superseded by another tale that said the skull's original owner had been one Ned Dixon, a soldier who had lived on the farm during the 16th century. Ned left Derbyshire and travelled to France to fight in the French Wars of Religion, taking place throughout the latter half of the century when Catholics and the Huguenots lived in a prolonged state of conflict. During the fighting at the Battle of Ivry, Ned found himself severely wounded when he threw himself on the line in order to save Lord Willoughby. After this premature exit from the fighting, Ned returned home to Tunstead Farm, only to find that his cousin, Jack Johnson and his wife, had taken control of the farm, presuming Ned to be dead. Not willing to give up their newfound status as homeowners so easily, they invited Ned to stay the night and then killed him in his sleep, 
burying him in secret. It was not all sunshine and rainbows on the farm, however, and soon after Ned's murder, the livestock were said to fall ill, crops failed, and an unaccountable noise rattled throughout the farmhouse at night. The couple were advised to seek the help of an old wise woman who told them they should dig up Ned's body and keep his skull within the confines of the house, telling them that he will then feel he has got his fair share. The pair took the advice, and just as the woman had told, peace returned to the farm. It works as a nice origin story, however, sadly for the facts, the Dixons did not actually live on the farm during the time the story is set, suggesting that at least some embellishment has been made, if it hasn't been fabricated entirely. When the skull was later inspected, and said to have belonged to a young woman, the story variously changed to have belonged to a witch who once lived on a farm and a young lady tenant who had lived on the farm with their sister and upon her deathbed she wished for her bones to remain in the house forever. After her death, the house fell to a spat of hauntings until the skull was dug up and placed on the windowsill of the room that the lady was said to have passed away in. This story dovetails nicely with several stories of a ghostly vision said to have been seen all over the farm of a young lady. One tale tells of how an owner in the late 1800s was sitting in a chair in the downstairs room when a woman, he presumed was a maid, came down the stairs and moved over to the fireplace to his child's crib. Upon seeing the woman approach the child, the man warned her to be quiet as to not wake the baby and mentioned that they would soon be going upstairs to bed. As he spoke, however, the woman simply disappeared. Soon after this account, the baby passed away and the vision was attributed to Dickie and considered a warning of the coming illness. For as much as the origins of the skull are muddled, the stories told of what would happen if the skull were to be removed or disrespected in any way are far from it. Dickie watches over the land with a keen eye and at night people are said to have been followed across the farm by a black dog attributed to the skull that disappears into the hillsides once the farm boundaries are left. When an old merchant was riding a wagon loaded with hay was foolish enough to swear upon Dickie's name, he found his cart toppled over. Voices are heard on the wind all around the farm and on at least one occasion, though the stories suggest it may have happened twice, the skull was stolen from the farm and taken to Manchester. The disturbances laid out upon the thieves were so great, including deafening and fearful noises, that the thieves returned the skull voluntarily. As a guardian for the farm, a ghostly visage and a prankster with a dark sense of humour to those that paid little respect, Dick is widely known and highly spoken of throughout the local area, but the skull's greatest claim to fame was cemented in 1863 when the London and North Western Railroad proposed to construct a new rail line straight through the middle of Dickie's land. Dickie, none too keen on this idea, took it upon himself to sink the bridge that was marked to carry the track repeatedly into the surrounding marshland until the railway were forced to reconsider and rebuild a new bridge, diverting the line around the farm. This event saw Dickie immortalised, both in local legend as the bridge became known as Dickie's Bridge, and in a song when a ballad was written of the exploit by Samuel Laycock and published in newspapers throughout July of 1863. Now Dickie, be quiet with thee lad, and let navvies and railways be. More they shouldn't do so, it's too bad, what harm are they doing to thee? Dead folk shouldn't meddle at all, but leave the matters to the wick. They'll see they're done, gradlin' and no. Dost your what or say to thee, Dick? Stories of Dickie persisted right up through to the 20th century until, at some point in the 1980s, it simply disappeared after the house changed ownership several times. The last owners to have spoken about the skull, when asked, simply stated that they had no idea of its existence on the farm and they'd never even seen it since their arrival. Dickie may have been one of the most famous 19th century accounts of a screaming skull, but he certainly wasn't the only one. By the Victorian era, stories slowly seeped out of the woodwork in antiquarian journals and esoteric publications on local history. One such account being that of the mysterious skull of Burton Agnes Hall. Standing proudly in the centre of acres of long, flat farmland 
in the eastern extremity of Yorkshire, 60 miles to the northeast of Leeds in northern England, lies Burton Agnes Hall, a large, grand old mansion building built of imposing red brick. The first dwelling to have been built at the site was the smaller, original manor house owned by Roger de Steuterville in 1173. Since this time, the estate, now vastly expanded upon over the centuries, has passed down through generations without once being sold to anyone outside of the family. Home to a tower and gatehouse, two listed buildings and sprawling grounds with included woodland, the old manor has a more mysterious secret bricked away within its walls in the form of a screaming skull. Oral traditions in the area tell that the skull comes from one of the daughters of Sir Henry, who owned the hall at the turn of the 17th century and who passed away in 1620. Sir Henry was said to have had three daughters named Frances, Margaret and Catherine, who was better known by her birth name, Anne. At the turn of the 17th century, a large red brick hall was built onto the property, a project which Anne was said to have been passionately involved in. Shortly after the completion of the building works, however, Anne was attacked, robbed and left for dead by two beggars whilst visiting family in a nearby village. On her deathbed, she told her surviving sisters that she wished for her head to be removed and stored on a table within the newly built hall. The sisters merely nodded along to this strange request, assuring her they would keep the promise. After Anne passed, the sisters discarded the macabre concept and opted instead to bury their sister like most normally families would do. This disobeying of Anne's final wish was soon the focus of regret, when loud bangs, knocking sounds and disturbances were heard all throughout the night. The sisters visited a local priest and told them of their sister's wish. Upon his advice, they arranged to have Anne's body exhumed and her head removed in order for them to place her skull in the hall as she had wished. Once the process had been carried out, the disturbances at once fell quiet. The skull has since been removed only on two documented occasions over the centuries. First, by a housemaid who, upon taking a disliking to the skull, tossed it out of the window onto a passing manure cart. As soon as the skull landed in the back of the wagon, however, the pulling horses were said to have stopped in their tracks and refused to budge another inch until the skull was removed and returned to its rightful place in the hall. The second time it was removed was much later after the family known as the Boyntons inherited the property. Feeling the skull might be better off buried, they sunk it into the earth in the grounds of the house. However, this only led to more disturbances throughout the night. The most dismal wailings and cries kept the house in a state of disquietude and alarm until it was dug up and restored to its place in the hall when they ceased. The last of the Boyntons to own the hall in the mid-20th century put an end to the skull's public presence by choosing to brick it up in a secret location behind a wall in the house rather than remove it entirely. Rumours suggest that it's stored safely in a small custom-built cubby hole behind the fireplace in the Queen's State bedroom in the northern wing of the house, a room which is said to be haunted by a ghostly image of Anne, known as Old Nance. This location is disputed locally, however, as an old builder who remembers the work undertaken to brick up the skull believes it to have been above a doorway somewhere in an upper passage. The story attached to the skull of Bert and Agnes Hall is, like many others, very neat and tidy until one investigates the history behind the names mentioned, as was the case with Anne, who was promptly found to not exist in any records for the family. Sir Henry did at one point have three sons and two daughters, though none were called Catherine nor Anne, and only two, a daughter named Frances and a son named Henry, made it to their teenage years alive. The records are not complete, however, and a teaser for the oral tradition does exist in the form of a portrait hung in the hall that's dated 1620 of three women, one of which is Frances, and one, presumably Anne, who is wearing black suggesting that the portrait was painted posthumously. The mystery behind the skull's ownership is an interesting twist that walks in a grey area between oral tradition and recorded history and not completely answered on either side. By the late 19th century, folklore surrounding screaming skulls became far more prominent, centred upon two stories 
which were brought to public attention through the publication of an 1874 edition of the popular quarterly Notes and Queries, a scholarly journal published four times a year since 1849, where all manner of literary, historical and antiquarian matters are discussed via reader submission. In this particular issue, a writer told the tale of a skull in Dorset, which prompted the reply of another reader, who questioned the first, suspecting he may have the story confused, as he knew of a skull just like the one described, but that this skull lay in a house in nearby Somerset. What followed was the uncovering of two tales, now widely known and commonly referred to as the skulls of Theophilius Broom and of Betterscombe Manor. The parish of Chilton Cantilo, a tiny hamlet consisting of around 30 houses, lying near the outskirts of Somerton, 20 miles to the east of the town of Taunton, and five miles north of Yeovil in Somerset, is a small collection of old grey stone houses, in the centre of which stands the Church of St James, a cross-shaped building whose tower dates from the early 15th century, though the lower sections date back much earlier. Lying to the rear of the building, a churchyard is home to a handful of headstones, many of which are now transplanted from their original standing place and propped up against the back of the church building itself. In the late 18th century, at the entrance to a crypt lying beneath the northernmost corner of the church itself, lived an aged piece of carved limestone, into which a coat of arms adorned with three sprigs of broom is chiselled into the worn surface. Below these arms, an inscription reads, Here lieth the body of Theophilius Broom, of the Brooms, of the House of Woodlows, near Warwick Town in the county of Warwick, who deceased the 18th of August, 1670, aged 69. A man just in his actions of his life, true to his friends, forgave those that wronged him and died in peace. The crypt would have been otherwise unassuming, the contents long decayed and forgotten, if not, of course, for the fact that the body inside was buried, as per Broom's instructions, without his head. There is a tradition in this parish that the person here interred requested that his head might be taken off before his burial and be preserved at the farmhouse near the church, where a head, chopped fallen enough, is still shewn, which the tenants of the house have often endeavoured to commit to the bowels of the earth but have been as often deterred by horrid noises portentive of sad displeasure, and about twenty years since, which perhaps was the last attempt, the sexton, in digging the place for the skull's repository, broke his spade in two pieces, and uttered a solemn asseveration, never more to attempt an act so evidently repugnant to the quiet of Broom's head. Broom's story is once more a messy tangle of oral tradition, eventually committed to paper in... History and Antiquities of the County of Somerset in 1791 by a reverend and historian named John Collinson, published just two years before his untimely death at the age of only 36. The earlier and lasting oral story follows that before his death, in 1670, Broom had been an active royalist, fighting in the English Civil War during the 1640s, but upon witnessing the horrid crimes of his fellow soldiers, he defected to the side of the Roundheads who fought for the parliamentarians against the divine right of the kings to rule the country. One of the more twisted practices carried out at the time was for the royalists to behead the most traitorous victims and mount them on spikes as trophies to warn others against opposing their might. Probably the most infamous example of this was the head of Oliver Cromwell, the man who had taken over the Commonwealth after the end of the Civil War and who died in 1658. When the king returned from exile in 1661, he had Cromwell's body exhumed, taken to the Tyburn Gallows, the principal place for hangings of London's criminals for over 250 years, and once his body arrived, it was hanged for several hours before being cut down. Cromwell's head was then removed and placed on a 20-foot tall spike above Westminster Hall, where it lived for almost 30 years, before being blown down in a storm. In 1670, when Cromwell's skull was still firmly on display and Broom lay on his deathbed in a dim bedroom of Higher Farm Cottage in Chilton Cantalow, he insisted to his sister that before his burial, his own head should be removed and kept within the old farmhouse to ensure that if any lingering royalists were to exhume his body, they would be unable to find a head at all and therefore unable to mount it as a trophy. Today, Broom's skull sits in a cabinet 
in the old farmhouse of Higher Farm, which has remained under ownership by the same family for multiple generations. It sits directly opposite the church that holds the crypt of the rest of his body. The current owners also hold a manuscript that dates back to 1829, which contains statements from various parishioners throughout the years confirming the traditions of the skull and relating tales of its supernatural history. One story within the manuscript, added by Anne Dunman, appears to be a version of the story published in 1791 by Collinson. Farmer Priddle and Edward Flukes remembered when the skull was brought downstairs and put in a cupboard. Edward Flukes went to Yeovil and bought a new spade and went to his relation, Mr Clark, who said, Now, Uncle Doctor, let us go and bury the skull when we have had a crust of bread and cheese. He said he would not, but after some time he went but with an ill will to bury it in the churchyard. The spade broke off at the first spit, and so they took it back again. He thought it presumptuous to attempt it, as the man had begged that some part might be buried there and the rest in some other places. Interestingly, the part of this story that speaks of Broom's burial suggests that Broom was buried in several other places. This is likely a reference to an oral tale that surrounded the skull that believed Broom's body to have been separated, with parts buried in three different locations. However, we now know that this is to be untrue, as Broom's crypt has since been opened during restoration work at the church that was undertaken in the 18th century, and his body was documented as remaining whole, minus the head. Over the years, several other tales of attempts to reunite the skull with the body in the crypt have been made, all apparently being thwarted by disturbances thought to have been attributed to the skull. Interestingly, in 1826, during renovations carried out in the farmhouse, the builders were said to have drunk beer from the skull, using it like some form of twisted goblet. This apparently had no detrimental effects. Renowned parapsychologist and author Peter Underwood who wrote of the skull in 1988 in his book Ghosts of Dorset, theorised that this story only strengthened the paranormal claims and that the skull would only let out screams or cause paranormal activity to take place if any attempts to reunite it with its body were to be made. Broom, after all, had never stipulated that his skull should not be used as a drinking vessel. Contrary to this, however, Underwood then goes on to tell a story involving two journalists, who were said to have visited the skull in 1977 and who were said to have questioned its authenticity. On their return trip to London, the journalists wound up in a car accident that saw the driver injured whilst the passenger suffered severe burns from dropping a match into the hem of his trousers as he attempted to light a cigarette. Sadly, there exists no evidence that any of this story is little more than an extension of the oral folklore that surrounds the skull. Whilst the current owner does not believe in any stories that the skull causes disturbances, telling academic and historian David Clark in 1988 that he had always been a quiet and respected gentleman. He does, however, believe that the skull brings protection and good luck to the family, provided it is left alone and not mishandled. The tale of the second skull, mentioned in 1874's Notes and Queries, is that of the original submission that prompted the story of Theophilius Broom and is perhaps one of the most famous of the skull cases over the years becoming archetypal of the particular skull genre. Lying six miles to the northwest of Bridport, Betterscombe Manor sits at the feet of Sliding Hill. It's a large U-shaped brick and stone house rebuilt on the ancient land in 1694 and owned by a singular family, the Pinnies, for a handful of generations. Previously, the site had seen both an ancient Roman fort and, during medieval times, a settlement owned by an enclave of monks from Normandy. The earliest oral traditions of the skull were first put to print in 1847, where Mrs Anna Maria Prinney, the wife of the then owner of the house, uncovered a series of writings on the subject in family papers and arranged for a visit to the house to see the skull for herself. Mrs Groves at the farm politely took us over the hole and on opening a long dark cupboard upstairs said, not very mysteriously, As you know, ma'am, all about Betterscombe, of course you'll have heard of the skull of Betterscombe House. And from the depths of the closet, she produced a white and perfectly human skull. Whilst this skull is kept here, no ghost will ever infest Betterscombe House, said Mrs G, 
To which I added, I thought it very probable, though I was beginning to feel myself rather like a being of another century in that dwelling. The story was then later built upon in 1874, when judge and antiquarian John Udall wrote a letter to Notes and Queries describing the story, which, in a follow-up from one Dr Goodford, was then linked back to the previous skull story of Chilton Cantalo, when he wrote to ask if Adal had not mistaken the name of the skull's home. At a farmhouse in Dorsetshire at the present time is carefully preserved a human skull, which has been there for a period long antecedent to the present tenancy. The peculiar superstition attaching to it is that if it be bought out from the house, the house itself would rock to its foundations, whilst the person by whom such an act of desecration was committed would certainly die within the year. It is strangely suggestive of the power of this superstition that through many changes of tenancy and furniture, the skull still holds its accustomed place, unmoved and unremoved. Udal assured readers in a further reply that he had the name of the manor house perfectly correct, and he further went on to furnish Goodford with his account of the skull's origin. Through this, and one other account of the skull, the origin story is twofold, and one story is quite different to the other. The first tells of Azariah Pinney, a 17th century owner of the manor who had been transported to the island of Nevis in the West Indies after he had been convicted of high treason in Dorchester in September of 1685 following the failure of the Monmouth Rebellion. A military coup attempted by the Duke of Monmouth, an illegitimate son of the king popular in the West Country, where contempt for the situation was still rife after the conclusion of the Civil War. Pinney had been tried along with 250 other men and was one of 13 who were sentenced to execution in Bridport, though it appears that this sentence was later commuted in favour of transportation and forced labour, as the story goes on to relate that Pinney, having won, or much more likely, bought his freedom, was living in Nevis as an exile rather than convict labour and had set himself up on a sugar plantation which quickly prospered. Azariah's son, John Pinney, returned to England in the late 17th century and in tow brought along with him a faithful slave who had been working on the plantation, whom he had named Old Betterscombe. The slave, however, was far from a free man in England and John Pinney was said to have kept him in a small cupboard and fed him by having his food pushed through the bars of an iron grill that fronted the box. Upon the slave's deathbed, he made a wish that his body might be laid to rest in his native land, and that if this wish were to be ignored, then the house would have no peace. This version of the story seems to have persisted throughout the history of the skull, with various retellings and embellishments through various oral transitions. At times, the slave was a man of noble birth, and others, a simple plantation hand, who had served the Pinney family faithfully and journeyed to England with John Pinney of his own free will. Either way, the story is unlikely to be true, as it turned out that when the skull was inspected by Dr Gilbert Corsi, the Professor of Human and Comparative Anatomy at the Royal College of Surgeons in 1963, he found the skull to be that of a woman. The skull is complete except from the mandible and a break in the left zygomatic arch. The whole bone structure is rather lightly made and the muscle markings are not prominent. It is probably a female skull, aged between 25 and 30 years, probably nearer 30. I think all of these quantitative data lead to just one conclusion, that this is a normal European skull, a bit small in its overall dimensions, but certainly not negroid. This finding did, however, tally much better with Adele's second theory of the skull, the second origin story had once again been the subject of oral tradition in the area, and Adal had heard it told that the skull had belonged to a murdered woman who had been kept confined within a hastily made cell in the attic of the house. More modern theories exist, and some propose that it's ancient in origin, dating back as far as the Celts, buried as part of a ritual in a nearby hill fort. This is all on account of the particular discoloration of the bone. Of course, stories have since sprung up about this too, claiming that the skull was dug up from a spring within the hill fort as part of a foundation sacrifice when the house was rebuilt in 1694, or that it was unearthed during the building works and kept as a good luck charm. However the skull came to be, it has genuinely stood in the house for several hundred years. 
Its original home was said to be atop a rafter by the attic, but when that was removed, it was kept in a box, secreted away in a small cubby hole within the attic itself, which is where Adele saw it himself in the mid-1880s. Its surroundings were certainly of a character to add to the mystery of his existence there. The dark attic extended over the entire area of the house. The floor was in a very unsound and unsafe condition, and evidently from its appearance had long been the home of bats, owls and other fearful fowl, for which easy access was afforded by the many openings in the ancient, massive and dilapidated stone-tiled roof. To say nothing of the nest of young birds, I myself discovered close to the skull's resting place. Hold up towards the rear of the attic, behind a small partition wall, and through a small, poorly constructed doorway, the skull sits in a chamber room, 15 foot by 12 foot, next to a small brick fireplace in the chimney breast. Within its time at the house, it has had various stories attached to both its guardian powers of protection and of powers less benevolent. Primary among the latter is the idea that if one were to attempt to remove the skull from the house, they would die within one year, a story attested to by visitors to the manor in the mid-20th century, when the son of a former tenant of the house paid the skull a visit from Australia. This man told the Pinney family that he had grown up hearing stories of the skull from his mother. His father, he said, had been a former tenant of the house before the family had emigrated, who, during a lively Christmas party, had tossed the skull into a nearby duck pond. The following morning, the skull mysteriously reappeared on the manor's doorstep. The family had forgotten all about the skull, and Betterscombe was a distant memory when the father died shortly after landing in Australia. The visitor told the Pinnies that his mother had brought him up with the story, convinced that his father had been cursed by the skull. This story may sound far-fetched, However, it's given slightly further credence, or at least it can be tied back to a story related to by Aldao in 1910, who said that he had heard a story of a former tenant who had thrown the skull into the duck pond, only to be seen fishing it out two days later, after he had suffered a bad time of it and had been disturbed by all kinds of noises. Though, in this version, it has obvious differences, namely that the skull was fished out rather than mysteriously appearing on the doorstep. In fact, the skull being thrown into the water is a common theme, as the very earliest oral traditions of the skulls, so to date back to the 1770s, told of the skull being thrown into a lake, and until returned to the house two days later, kept the owner awake by causing thumps and bangs throughout the house all through the night. Once the skull had been returned, of course the house stood quiet once again. Outside of causing death, the skull is said to cause agricultural grief for those who attempt to remove it, killing crops, livestock and driving farms into the ground. Then, of course, comes the screaming. In earlier accounts, the skull seemed to cause only disturbances within the house, as was the case when a young boy who lived there tried to test the legend for himself by taking the skull outside and hiding it within a bale of hay. For two nights before the boy returned the skull, the house was said to have suffered from Noises as though all the china in the house were being broken. In another account, slithering noises were heard outside the bedroom at night. By the early 1900s, however, it had moved on to screaming, truly earning its name. In one account, the skull was removed from its place in the attic, only to lead to nightly screams that were so loud that apart from the occupants of the house, they were heard by farm workers in the field outside though quite what these workers were doing working at night is anyone's guess. In the 1960s, a story was related by an old farmhand who had worked in the farm as a boy and who said he had once heard the skull screaming like a trapped rat in the attic. Interestingly, just 10 miles away, another skull exists known as the Wadden Skull, which shares many similar legends to the skull of Betterscombe, suggesting that, over time, the stories have intermingled and muddled one another. The Wadden Skull was once again said to be from a black slave whose owner, on this occasion, murdered him by striking him in the head with a sword after mistaking him for a burglar. Upon its rediscovery in the basement of Wadden House, it was put forth for inspection at Southampton University, where it was once again found to be European in origin. Marks were found in the bone, suggesting the head had actually been struck by a sharp instrument, though the present owners put forth a theory 
that the skull is from a fallen soldier on a nearby Civil War battlefield. As the 20th century progressed, so too did the stories of screaming skulls, and not wanting to seem boring with only a single skull, the area of Bradshaw Brook in Lancashire, northern England, claims nothing short of a trio. The first two were said to have been fished out of the brook in 1751 and placed by the fireplace in a nearby farmhouse at Timberbottom Farm on the outskirts of Bolton. The story progressed in 1880 when oral traditions spoke of the skulls as belonging to a pair of would-be burglars who attempted to rob the farm one evening until a servant caught them in the act and somehow beheaded the pair. Later, a second servant tossed the skulls into the brook where they were then fished out following a series of disturbances that only stopped once the skulls were returned. The skulls were said to have caused pots and pans to fly about the kitchen if disturbed and in the mid 20th century the owners reported seeing a pair of men fighting in the kitchen dressed in strange old costume whilst a woman looked on in horror. The scene was said to have replayed on a monthly schedule prompting the removal of the skulls and their burial in a nearby churchyard though when this had no effect on the haunting, they were dug up and returned. When the skulls were displeased, cows were said to give little to no milk. Finally, Colonel Hardcastle of Bradshaw Hall suggested to the owners that he take the skulls and keep them on his family bible. The owners agreed and the skulls were removed, putting an end to the ghostly activity. In 1949, the skulls were gifted to the local council for their display in what would become a folk musician at Turton Tower, a 15th century manor house in Bolton. Today, the skulls are locked away in an upstairs storeroom, and though the owners claim to have no belief in the skulls' supposed paranormal powers, they're kept upon a Bible, just in case. The two skulls pulled from Bradshaw Brook are linked with a third skull residing in the Pack Horse Inn in Greater Manchester. The building is an old, white stone block of a structure built in the 15th century on a medieval pack horse route. The pub laid claim to a skull, which in life was said to have been the property of a local farmer named George Hewell, who returned home one day during the Civil War to find his family murdered by royalists. After the local leader of the royalists, the Earl of Derby, was captured, George took it upon himself to volunteer to carry out his execution in revenge. After the restoration, and apparently George's death, his body was said to have been exhumed and his skull placed in the pub for ridicule, where it stayed, sat atop the bar for several hundred years. In 1949, when the then licensee of the pub sold up and moved on, he declined an offer from the local museum to take the skull, saying that ill luck is supposed to dog the footsteps of those who interfere with it. An alternative story of the skull links it with Timberbottom Farm, saying that it is actually the third skull of a trio that was fished from the brook in 1751. If this were true, it's anyone's guess as to how it wound up in a pub, though it does tie in nicely with the story of the haunting in the kitchen, where there were three ghostly figures rather than just two. Interestingly, as the skull stories move into the 20th century, the solid, factual and checkable history gives way more and more to vague rumour and oral traditions built upon shaky Victorian foundations. In 1925, a skull came to light, living in Parsonage Manor in Kent, in the southeast of England. Years ago, a young girl was murdered in the vicinity, and her skull evidently found a resting place in a cupboard at the top of the attic stairs. Discovered there by a new tenant of the farm some years ago, it was reverently buried in the ground, but the interment was followed by the sounds of groans within the house. Someone who understood the ways of distressed spirits suggested that the skull be returned to its old sanctuary the cupboard of the attic stairs, and the result brought happiness to everyone. So there the skull still lies. No groans disturb the stillness of the night, and all is well. Local oral legend said that this skull had originally belonged to a nun who had shipped to England from France around the time of the Civil War and been murdered, somehow as a result of unrequited love. Her bones were originally buried within the cellar of the house, but they were later removed to the grounds outside, though the skull mysteriously returned, bricked up in a cellar wall. When the house changed hands, the old owner told the new owner not to ever remove the skull. However, they went and did so anyway, 
boxing it up and placing it in the attic. Consequently, the couple's business soon went bankrupt and they eventually sold the house and moved away from the area. The skull seems to have been lost sometime around the 1990s and today its current whereabouts is unknown. The origins of the individual screaming skulls is no less muddled than the origins of the oral traditions at large. Whether they were leftover products of Celtic beliefs, pagan rituals, saintly worship, or a deep-seated veneration for the human spirit, human skulls have held an undeniable draw throughout the ages. Across the world, we can see skulls that give power, divine the future, provide protection, summon gods, haunt old village halls, or serve as a warning to would-be enemies. The screaming skulls seem to be a folk legend that has evolved from a long extra tradition spanning centuries and continents. In reality, the screaming skull folklore is something of a misnomer, as most skulls were not originally thought to scream at least until it became a firm trope, tacked onto many legends in the early 20th century. The complicated backstories of each skull that twist and wind over the years lend both an air of mystery to the tales and an obvious flaw in their veracity. Regardless, their stories have survived and even flourished with the explosion of the gothic ghost stories of Victorian times and the flood of moral horror from the mid-20th century onwards. The motif of the haunted skull continues. Nowadays, it becomes harder and harder to find an owner of a screaming skull who publicly admits to believing in the skull's supernatural powers. But interestingly, in many cases, far fewer are keen to remove them from their places of rest, which one might presume tells a completely different story. So that was the story of the screaming skulls. It's a really interesting folk tradition. I mean, as with any folk tradition, it, it, it can be a little, I mean, more than a little ropey, but it's really interesting how a lot of it's rooted in actual genuine history. So, you know, after the break, we'll talk a bit about those two distinctions. Thanks for listening to Dark Histories. This podcast is entirely independent and funded by myself and listener support. So in order to do that, I need to run a few ads. Our long-time advertising partner is Audible, and the reason I've stuck with them for so long is that they offer a service that I actually use and enjoy myself. And I do think it actually offers value to people like myself who enjoy podcasts. If you're unaware of what Audible is, it's an audiobook subscription service which charges a monthly fee in return for one credit, which you're free to spend on any audiobook you like. The catalogue is huge, multilingual, and covers everything from fiction to series of lectures. They have an iOS, Android and web app, and if you use more than one, they all sync up together so that you can listen on any of your devices without having to skip about. If you ever feel like you want to take a break from the subscription, you can do so and you get to keep all your previously bought books. And when you get into a drought, you can just fire it up again and start gaining credits seamlessly. Some of my favourite books on there to date are The Complete Sherlock Holmes, which is read by Stephen Fry. And they've also got the original Exorcist book and just a huge history back catalogue. And I've really enjoyed all of those, basically. So if this sounds like something you might be interested in, head over to audible.com forward slash dark histories. And that's dark histories, all one word. And you can start a free trial that offers a monthly subscription with one free credit so that you can instantly pick an audiobook of your choice. If at the end of the trial, you feel like it's not really for you, you can just cancel it and it's cost you nothing and you get to keep your free book. So once again, that's audible.com forward slash dark histories or you can find the link in the show notes. So earlier I mentioned listener support and there are a ton of ways that you can get involved and support Dark Histories. The main way is to become a Patreon patron. If you listen to a lot of podcasts, I'm sure you're familiar by now. But for those not so much, Patreon is a way to make a monthly pledge in return for some small perks. On the Dark Histories Patreon, I set my pledges as low as I can really with options for one, three and five dollars per month. And for that, you gain things like early access episodes without these horrible ads, PDF notes and resources that I make and find during my research for each episode. 
There's also access to the live stream archives and more. So if you enjoy the show and you think it's worth it to you, hop over to darkhistories.com and you can find all the ways that you can support, including our Patreon, or just check out the links in the show notes. If none of that appeals, then sharing it around with all your friends and family is equally as helpful and just as much appreciated. So if you're here, then thanks so much for not skipping the ads with that 30 second skip button and giving my hard sell a listen. I'll let you get back to the episode. Cheers. Welcome back. Yeah, so Screaming Skulls, like I say, like it's quite difficult to figure out what is real and what is not real. It's like any sort of folk tradition, right? You're kind of left sort of picking through pieces of history, which leads you to one minute reading a story and confirming all of these details. And, you know, you think, oh, wow, this is true. That's true. This fact here is true. Jumping down this path through history. And then all of a sudden you hit this massive curveball that's like, oh, so that's made up. And, and that piece will be like a fundamental part of the story, which basically means that if all the other stuff is true, it doesn't really matter because this fundamental piece is it's just oral tradition and there's no sort of evidence or veracity whatsoever. Um, so it was, it was really interesting. I really enjoyed, like, like, like I really enjoy researching every episode really, but I really enjoy researching these folk stories, especially when, like I say, you can sort of get, to the places although you know of course at the moment you can't get to those places but but you can find them on google earth you you can see that they exist you can go on you know some of these churches and and villages and stuff have got websites that have pictures of all of these places and, and, and all the rest of it so you can see that, that you know there's living breathing history there and that's just a really interesting fun part of history to sort of scour through you know bits of history that you can still see today you know that, that aren't tucked away in a museum that they're, they're still like with this story, there's still people owning the skulls. And, and like I said at the start, I spoke to several of them and they were really nice people. And they, a lot of them, the skull's not a big part of their life, it seems. Like, uh, in fact, I would say it's almost not a part of their life. For, for some of, I contacted one person and they said, oh, yeah, yeah, no one's talked about this for, for years. And, and, and they kept it just sort of buried away in the back of like some cabinet that they didn't go to. It wasn't really a... Like I say, it was, it's not not a big part of these people's lives, but they keep the story going. I think, and I think that's probably why they were so open to me approaching them, because in for them, they're keeping that story alive. You know, that it's almost like a family tradition to keep the story alive. In many cases, at least three or four cases, I was contacting people whose great great grandparents were the, you know, the first person to have written you know, committed the story to paper at all. Oh, I can see how it's quite important for them to want to keep that story alive and keep it going and propagate it throughout time almost. It's, it was, it's really fascinating. Uh, and say a, a great episode to research. I really enjoyed doing it. Um, so yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. The skulls are interesting. I mean, I think it goes without saying that I, I don't really believe them to be, you know, paranormal or whatnot. But it, but it's interesting the superstitions behind it, um, and and when you dig into that again, it's another layer of of fascination, it, and it gets a little academic at this point because you start sort of digging into sort of the deeper cultural aspects of skull worship and head worship throughout the centuries, and that can get quite quite heavy going. But it but it's fascinating all the same, and I think in this case you can see a clear path from a lot of that stuff to, you know, the way the stories have evolved and transformed into what they are today. I think what they are today is is very different. I think it's largely, like I said, they've, they've just sort of turned into these oral tales which have got an element of kind of thea- theatrics and um, entertainment value to them. Do you know what I mean? So they, 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 that's obviously, they, they're far removed from the sort of academic discussion on kind of head worship and that. But you can see that clear delineate, uh, that clear sort of linear timeline almost to, throughout the stories and the way they've evolved. So, yeah, it was great. Something I found really interesting is how so many, mo- like almost like motives throughout each story recur. 
a common theme seems to be people throwing it in a lake and then having to fish it back out. It's almost like somewhere along the line this was attached to one of these skulls and somehow that story is sort of seeped into the legends of all of the skulls because almost every skull has a story of it being thrown in the lake at one point or another. That I found really interesting, um, the way that sort of happens over and over again. And I think that's a common thing, like I say, that you had the, 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 the idea of it being tossed in the water, but also the idea that these people are often sort of died in traumatic circumstances. And, and the, the two skulls where it was thought to have been a black slave, that again gets very interesting in the way these stories are told almost as a, a guilt for British involvement in the slave trade where, you know, the slave is now retold as being like of a noble birth or the slave came on his own free will to England or, you know, the slave was in some way or another generally well looked after. You know, it's this rewriting of history or repositioning a slave to be something higher in the narrative than just a slave. Um, and, and that is is a recurring theme throughout history in the, the early 20th century and the Victorian period where you start getting colonial guilt and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. You think it's silly on the one hand, you know, you've got these screaming skulls and the stories of really good fun and they're all about kind of like, you know, haunted bones and all the rest of it. And that's great fun. But then there's plenty here that you can really get your teeth into and like get deep down into like kind of history and culture and, and all sorts of like sort of reasoning behind the, re- you know, the, the reason these stories propagate and, and, and continue. So, yeah, really great um, stories. I hope you enjoyed them. Thank you very much for listening. I think I'm going to leave that there. So as always, yeah, thanks very much for listening. If you'd like to contact me about this episode or any any episode, if you contact me, I do sometimes get contacted about really old episodes and I'll be honest, I, I've probably forgotten them by now. Um, but, you know, still, you know, if you want to contact me, do. And, and I'll, some, some episodes I remember much better than others. Um, but yeah, you can do that. Contact at darkhistories.com is the email. Um, If you go to darkhistories.com, you can find that email there, as well as all the other ways that you can contact me, which is, um, you know, through the various social media like Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, whatnot. Um, Feel free to DM me if you'd like. And you can also find ways to support if you'd like to do so. Uh, By all means, don't feel like you need to. But if you would like that, that option's there. So you can find that out. You can also find the store where you'll find like T-shirts and and things like that. Um, So, yeah. Thanks very much. That's all that jibber jabber. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. And of course you're a patron. And then stay tuned because I'll be back again in a second for a little bit more of a chat. But otherwise, I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Stay healthy. Take care. Sleep tight.